welcome to our worship service here today at First Baptist Church in Rosenberg. Uh, our technical team, and our leaders are here this morning as we have been for the last several weeks and we're happy that you're joining us, whether you're sitting in your home in Rosenberg or Richmond or Needville or Katy, uh, Damon, wherever you may be, we're happy that you've chosen to worship with us today. Let's sing now, Here I Am to Worship. Step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I Glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created. All for love's sake became poor. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say.
Welcome this morning, church family. It's already good to be with you and already wonderful to share in this worship together. I want to say a special thanks to um, Mike Bursick and um, Brindley, uh, his granddaughter Brindley, for the wonderful art that uh, you see this morning that we're able to share with you and what a wonderful message it conveys. Right there on the sidewalk in, in chalk, uh, the hope of the world we find in Jesus Christ. We gather in his name this day and Thank you so much for our special artists this week who, who share with us. And I'm glad that you're here this morning. Welcome, church family, as we gather. We'll share these moments, some of us uh, together at, alive, but others along the way through the week. And we're happy you're here. We're especially proud to have a guest with us. And if you are with us, we, we'd count it an honor if you'd click on that link and register your uh, sharing this with us and uh, give us a chance to say thank you to you. We're very grateful you are here, and um, so, so very proud to be able to gather uh, virtually uh, to join our spirits and share this time of worship together. We are grateful, so grateful. We extend a very happy Mother's Day to uh, all who are listening this morning, uh, mothers who are gathered and listening. We are grateful, so grateful for you. We especially miss the chance to be together to share that with you in a very more personal way but uh, do extend and appreciate um, I, I trust uh, the extension of our heart and our warmth I voice the not only the uh, care of the staff uh, but and those who uh, gather around us to send this broadcast this morning but the entire church family to say happy Mother's Day we are grateful to God for you and I, I'm just very grateful uh, to acknowledge your contribution, especially during this very difficult season. My friend Jim Dennison sends along this uh, story. I don't know that we have a laugh track to go with it, but uh, here's the idea. Uh, it, it, it emphasizes how we do need to take care to say something about our gratitude to our mothers all the time, but especially on this day. Uh, Jim passes along the story um, that um, a son phones his, his mom on Mother's Day, and the son asks, uh, Mom, how are you doing? And she says, well, uh, you know, the truth is I'm not doing so well. I'm, I'm very weak. And he goes, weak? Mom, what's, what's going on? Uh, uh, have you been to the doctor? And, and she says, no, I, I don't need to go to the doctor. I, I think I know why I'm weak. And well, what, what's going on? Uh, the son presses, and the mom says, well, I haven't eaten for 23 days. 23 days? He says, Mom, you've, you've not eaten for 23 days. And she says, well, yes. And well, why, why aren't you eating? He, he, he asked again. And he said, well, you know, she said, I, I don't know. I don't want to have my mouth full in case my son were to call, right? So the, uh, the idea is it's pretty important uh, for you to call, and especially today, and uh, receive our warm greetings. And let me pass this on to you um, just as a tribute to all you do all the time, but especially... Uh, how many mothers are serving and having to find new ways to serve and care for us during this special time. And um, some of you know my daughter Amy is a children's minister, and uh, Amy and my wife Debbie, I, I think, teamed up for this um, little piece. It kind of pictures moms as, well, like a superhero who's called to help during this special time. And here it is from the top. Thanks, Mom. The greeting goes out. When your world changed, you did your best to keep mine safe and happy. And I know that's true for almost all time, but it's especially true now. So here's the superhero image of mom, the brave warrior, the mom, fighting germs, protecting our loves, saving off boredom, inspiring joy, conquering messes, creating sanctuary. Negotiating civil, uh, uh, sibling warfare, training in peace, overcoming online lessons, encouraging curiosity, vanquishing fears, speaking peace into little hearts, deploying hugs and kisses, loving deeply amid the chaos. Mothers, we're grateful for you, grateful to God, and I trust and pray that you'll have a very blessed Mother's Day. We have some other things I want to share with you briefly. Our women are, are on Wednesday night is their typical time to meet. 
Uh, but notice they're sharing a Zoom meeting and they're starting a new study. Make sure you take the opportunity to do that. There are other studies and things going on on Wednesday night as well and other ways to, sh to take part. We're so grateful for the leadership in this area to keep these programs going and to keep our fellowship going and our growing. Uh, we are grateful, grateful. Uh, Brian and Jan and I get a little camera time from week to week, and I'm so appreciative of their leadership, but this morning we want to also recognize there's folks around us and, and uh, working, uh, sometimes feverishly working, uh, to get all this together and to allow this streaming to occur, and I want to pass on a special thanks to thank you. You see their faces and names there. I've named them a time or two along the way, and I just want to say uh, to each of them, Thank you so much and encourage you to voice your support and encouragement for these who have served us so, so very well. And finally, let me encourage you to be faithful in your giving. You, know, you see the link, which again, more and more of you are using. And I just uh, am so uh, appreciative of your ongoing faithfulness to support the church in this time. And then reaching beyond uh, what you typically do and supporting us, but also supporting any number of other uh, causes you've been generous uh, with church you've been generous to one another and I bless your name I, I, I want to encourage you to keep on giving and keep on caring uh, the church's work goes on and I am so very very appreciative of your faithfulness now will you join me uh, and, and let's voice a prayer together and let's be grateful for this occasion uh, grateful for this occasion to worship grateful for this occasion to remember mothers Will you join your hearts to pray with me? Gracious Father, we pray. Extend to us your spirit to move us and shape us. Use the words that we sing, the words from Scripture we will read, the encouragement of being together and worshiping together to shape us and ready us. We're not ready, Lord, as we come. We need your help. We need your healing. We need your spirit to attune us and to open our ears and to attune our hearts. And so we pray, God, as we're here watching this, some now, some later, we pray, would you, by your wonderful grace and spirit, would you speak to us and move us and attune our hearts to be focused on you and drawn together. We pray for your mercy for folks who are... Uh, struggling in so many ways, uh, so many ways routinely throughout the world, but now with this virus, so many ways that so many of us are sharing and seeing. And God, I just pray for your mercy and your care. I pray that you would, again, gather us and make us your people of worship and join our hearts to your heart, we pray. And this day, Father, we thank you for the way you care for us and love us through the ministry and care and love that you extend through mothers. And we are grateful for this gift, and I pray your affirmation and encouragement to each mother this day. And Father, bless us, sustain us, keep us, give us strength and health to do the work ahead. We pray for your blessing in Jesus' name. continue now to offer our songs of praise and sing this one as a prayer that God would guide us and lead us and heal us during this time. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
And I would say if we had a gathered house here and all the people said amen, and let me encourage you to add your amen. Thank you, Brian uh, and, and Jan this morning and the worship team. It is a, a wonderful occasion. We have already shared a, a feast uh, from the first uh, visual uh, to the songs that we've uh, sung and, and then this theme about Jehovah. Again, Brian, thank you. What a blessing it is. It ministers to my heart. We are all on this journey, and we're all learning to trust the great God, Jehovah. And we as Christians come to know him in a very particular way. And I want you to celebrate that with me this morning. If you'd find your way to John, the 14th chapter, I read from the New International Version, the first 14 verses. I'd encourage you to follow along. As you're finding your place, I, I've got just a little bit to do. I, I'm reminded this morning of uh, one of the people I've met um, in the career of teaching that I uh, just uh, really do admire and, and celebrate. He's a gifted teacher, and his students know that he uses this line routinely. He will occasionally say, now here it is. I want you to listen. This is my best explanation. This is my attempt to answer this question. And if you don't get it, I'm sorry, because I don't have a better answer. This is my best answer. And so it, it, it is frustrating when a, you make your best case and you do your very best, and then somebody raises their hand and answers, asks the question that you just thought you answered. Wow, is that heavy. But that's exactly what happens to Jesus this morning in the passage that we read. And we read a section from a larger conversation. It's troubling. And let me give you the scope of it before we read. It's troubling. Uh, Jesus has talked about going away, and that's unnerving. Uh, Jesus has talked about being betrayed from their very number. That's troubling. Even Simon Peter is going to deny him. So troubling. The world is brewing, and it seems to be sort of focusing in right there on Jesus and his circle, and Jesus is trying to tell them Things are about to happen. It's all about to happen. And they are, well, frightened and unnerved and worried and heavy. He encourages them, don't let your fear continue to grip you. Don't let this troubling disposition overtake your hearts. He tells them to believe in God, and then he tells them to believe in, in uh, himself. He encourages them. Uh, there's a, a, a destiny that God has prepared for us. And uh, I'm not sure it's like we ima um, imagine with the song, uh, I've got a mansion up over the hilltop. I don't know that it's a, we get our own mansion. I think the idea is we're all part of God's mansion. We're part of his estate. But within this place, there is a particular place for you. That's what Jesus uses to encourage him. And he tells them, I'm going away. And you can't come. And then the question. First from Thomas. Lord, I don't get this about going away. I, we don't know the way. We don't know where you're going. Uh, I, I don't know the way that you're going to follow what's going on here. And he has to tell him. Uh, Thomas, you're mixing things up. And, and I get it in a way, the destination is one thing, the road is another thing, the means is one thing, the end is another thing, but in this case, I need you to understand, the means and the end are the same. If you find me, if you get me, you get what you need. I am the way, and I'm the truth. And we lead to the life in this destiny that's before you. I'm all of that. I'm not just a means to an end. I'm the end who sort of come to you and reached out to you and shown you who God is. That's how you know who God is, is you know him through what I've done for you. It's question number two, Philip says. Uh, Philip, uh, hey, isn't it just enough, Jesus, that you just show us who the Father is, maybe, right? You just show us who God is, right? Can we just see God? Enough of what you're saying, right? Just let us see God. We, we puzzle as to what Philip exactly means. Is he just asking for a miracle? Is he asking that old question about really seeing God that's so mysterious and handled in so many different ways in the Old Testament? You remember these, right? 
Sometimes we picture face-to-face -face encounters. Other times we have a strict uh, prohibition that we don't see God really at all. And other times we get an idea that some special people get a glimpse of God here and there. And we try our best to put all these images together. But uh, if, if I were just honest with you, I, I think the purpose of those kinds of visions is this. If we spoke just straightforwardly, and I could sum God up in some simple little line for you, it wouldn't be honest. God is above our pay grade. He is beyond what we can understand. He is mysterious to us. And there's this great profundity to who he is. And we just can see it bits and pieces. And we get one inside and another inside. And we have to live humbly to put these pieces together and to live within the instruction they give us and to go forward that way. He responds to Philip. And in time, it, it's later on in the chapter, Judas asks another question. How, how, how are you going to manifest this, this idea, this connection with the the Spirit and God and how it's all working. And I think Jesus' simple answer is you're going to see this play out in the giving of the Holy Spirit. And so these conversations trigger this text, but they include some of the most beautiful and central instructions about who Jesus is, that Jesus is abiding with God, that Jesus has hung out with God, that Jesus has a solidarity with God, a communion with God. And when you get Jesus, you get the real thing. You don't get a knockoff God, some lighter case uh, sort of God, some uh, witness merely to who God is. You get the genuine thing. And that's his proclamation. And that's finally our hope that we can know God, as mysterious as it is, but we can know God because Jesus has come and he's just simply shown us by God being present among us what God is like. We'll never know more about Jesus. Maybe not until the end, until we're transformed and in his presence. We'll never know more about God than we learn through Jesus. If you would, let's read this remarkable text. Will you follow along as I read? Chapter 14 from John's Gospel, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, you believe in God, right? That's the, I think that sense of this verb here. Well, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Now, Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answers, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Doubling down in verse 7, if you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do not know, uh, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip says, Lord, show us the father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, do you not know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me. Or at least, at the very least, believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name. So the Father may be glorified in the Son. And you, uh, 
uh, may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. This beautiful text, again, contains so much of what John seems to be about at his very core. Uh, I'll stop and give you, I hope you don't think it's like a pill, but a little bit of theology here. I, I want to just uh, affirm something about this text. This text is the nuts and bolts and makings of the doctrine of the Trinity. And that sound, sounds strange and mysterious and foreign to many of us, and I'm sorry for that, but the truth is this. Ideas about God are a dime a dozen, and there's a gazillion of them out there. But Christians come to this idea that we have met the great Jehovah God when we came to Jesus. And when we meet Jesus, we meet God. And when we learn God, Jesus, we learn God. And when we obey Jesus, we obey God. And we give God glory. I'm not uh, uh, attempting to map out the mysteries of Trinity here this morning, but I just want to say to you, you can't tell the Christian story without Father, Son, and Spirit. And Christians have been determined to keep this idea of God's unity and oneness, and yet they have been unwilling to surrender Father, Son, and Spirit. They're not just masks that God takes on for a while to play this role or that role in the drama. They somehow are witnesses to the very character of who God is. And not being willing to give up this unity and not being willing to surrender the Father, Son, and the Spirit, that's the making of the Trinity. And this text is all about that, if you understand what's going on here. Jesus is using a certain sort of logic to say, there is a unity between me and the Father. Me and the Father are together, and I am extending his work when I do my work. And don't be misunderstood. Don't be asking uh, to look beyond what I'm doing and then ask me about God. Jesus makes this point clear. If you're in sync with me, you're in sync with God. You know me, you know God. And he goes even further. There's not really any knowing of God unless you know him through who I am. And that's the centrality of the Christian confession, that we have met and found our peace and our destiny. We have that place on Jesus is a God's estate and in the, in the heavenly reality. There's a future. There's more to what's going on in the world and who we are than just the time that we have here. There's a destiny that awaits us. And the centrality to all of that is this person, Jesus, the Son. And if you see this Son as being central and being an expression of who God is, then you are in the business of Trinity. Don't be mistaken by the difficulty of Trinity. Be liberated by its deliberate acknowledgement of the profundity of God. We don't know everything, and we're not sure we can translate all things that are Trinity into our terms. Most every theologian has said, no, we know God on his terms. In fact, this text is actually shaped around the outline of Trinity. If you go on to read the rest of the, the text, it's Trinitarian. There's this beautiful image about the work of God going forward and the work of God is pushing forward in the world and so on. And we share in that work when we do what Jesus said. And we know we love him and we're sharing in this identity and we're abiding in Jesus like he's abiding in us. We know that's happening when we're privileged by the Spirit's work in us to obey. And when we do that, we extend the work and purpose of God in the world. And in verse 15 to 17, he talks about how the Spirit is crucial to that. And again, you'll love and know God through the ministry of the Spirit, and you'll participate in this love by being obedient to the Spirit. And then verses 18 to 22 talk about Jesus and his centrality. And then finally, in verses 23 and 24, it's the Father's centrality. The whole outline of the text is Trinitarian in its scope. And these mysteries are not to be just simply shook off, but they're to be pondered and celebrated. You have the good fortune not to just have speculated and anticipated and extrapolated to what God might be like. You have the good fortune and blessing of having seen and heard this one Jesus. And when you see him and you look in his face, you look into the face of God. And when you know him, you know the Father. And it's by knowing Him that you'll know the work of the Spirit that continues the work of the Father. 
there is in this mutual indwelling a partnership, a communion of love between Father, Son, and Spirit. And one of the great images of Christianity is we are allowed to be welcomed into that communion. And we will also share in this fellowship. And we can even share now in the realization that the destiny that awaits us is already prepared for us. And the work that we can do now is privileged now to be the work that God needs done in the world. What a privilege. It's something we ought to celebrate in. This strange, weird doctrine of the Trinity that you might have just shook off before, like not knowing what to do with it. It's really at the heart of everything we've been talking about, about who Jesus is and about who God is and how we can know the Father. We know him when we look the Son right in the face. Secondly, I just want to encourage you upon these beautiful images. One of his answers in this passage goes something like this in paraphrase. Now listen, you guys. Don't you know that I and the Father indwell? Don't you know that we abide? It's an image that's come up before and it's most completely celebrated in the next chapter, chapter 15. There, there's this abiding. We, we have this communion. We have this fellowship and this unity. And we belong as a solidarity together. And so I want you to believe what I'm talking about. I want you to trust me that I can show you the Father. I, I want you to see, don't you understand all that I've done along the way that you've been watching? It's because the Father and I share this unity. And the words that I speak, Jesus goes on in my paraphrase, the words I speak, they're, they're not something I commissioned on my own. They're the words of my Father that I'm sharing they have this authority because they come from God. And the works that I'm doing, they're the Father's work. The deeds that I'm performing, they're a manifestation of the Father's great purpose. And when you see what I'm doing, you know what God's doing. There's no slippage. There's no surrender. Jesus is full caliber, completely high octane, completely God. And this is the celebration that we must focus on today because the idea is this. The beauty of this day is that this special relationship is one that Jesus invites us into. No, we won't be full partners and it won't, we won't change the name of the place. When, we, uh, when I get there one day, uh, when the Lord is ready, uh, when I get there, I, I, it, the name won't change to Father, Son, Spirit, and Randy. But I will, and it's part of my destiny, share in the fellowship between them. And I'll share in this abiding. And I want to say to you that there's a celebration of the destiny that comes to us. And also, there's an instruction for how we're to live now. Because we can already, in fact, that's one of the things that John's uh, gospel is famous for. Uh, we don't have to wait till the end of time to know end of time kind of realities. These kind of things like eternal life that you expect that would be um, kind of given only at the end as you enter into eternity. John makes it a point to say, no, you can already know that eternal life and participate in it now. And so it is the fellowship of, that we know with the Father through Jesus Christ. We don't have to wait someday when that comes. We can already share in that now. And the routine of Jesus' words gives us the formula for living life now. We can live in transformed ways and do all the things we're called to do with a new sense of who we are and a new sense of destiny. And we shouldn't be sort of um, overconfident in this. We, we shouldn't be uh, kind of uh, th this kind of crazy confident. We should instead be humble but empowered nonetheless because life can be transformed when we live it this way. And your life and who you are and your identity starts this way. Are you abiding with Jesus? Are you hanging out with Jesus? Are you developing this solidarity with Jesus? Are you learning to hear his voice? We studied a few weeks back ago from chapter 13 of this very gospel, and the image was this. The Father is doing the work 
uh, the son is doing the work of the father, and that gives the father glory. And now the people who follow after the son, they do the work of the son, and that gives glory to him and glory to the father. And what a privilege it is if we can learn who Jesus is, if we can soak up who Jesus is, if we can love Jesus, spend time with Jesus, if we can learn his words and let them sink into our hearts, if we can abide with Jesus, we can begin to live differently. And it will change the nature of our words that we speak. They won't be words that reflect our deficit, our anger, our, our inadequacy, our sense of worthlessness and so on they won't be words of just injury and so on but they'll be words that are in commissioned by god's great project and we can now speak with the humility that we've been brought into the love of god and the words that come out of us can be words of encouragement and the works that we do can now be recast and re-envisioned we can attune them we can change them now they'll come from a new place a new motive because now the richness of being with Jesus will give us a liberty to execute the work that we must do in a way that reflects the joy and goodness of our new destiny in God. We've been brought into his family. We know who God is. We've had the good fortune of the God of all this world showing up right in our face in the person of Jesus, the Son. And I sense a confidence here I know and can have faith and trust in Jesus, this destiny and all that God is doing in me because I trust who he is. And the more I entrust my life to him, the more his character shapes mine. My words are truer and kinder. My works are done with a joy and a celebration and a confidence that faithfulness to Jesus is never, ever misspent. It's amazing how you live differently if you sense that the God of all this world would like to abide with you and you sense that you have a destiny that awaits an ongoing future with him, things about that relationship seem to work out in time to what we do and how we care for one another. Now, in some, with some misgiving about giving mothers a completely uh, too heavy guilt trip, I will acknowledge that my words and your words, my deeds and your deeds never match up to the grandeur and glory of the gospel. We are works and project, but I want to say one of the places when I look out at this world and see the love of God being extended more, more graciously and, and, and with greater humility than just anywhere else, it's this image of the ingrained care that God has placed on the hearts of mothers. And I just want to say to you, thank you. When you do what God has put in you to do, you are witnessing the goodness of God in creation. And when you do that in the name of Jesus and you do it with the spirit of Jesus informing who you are, your words will bear greater and greater significance and your deeds will give up greater and greater witness. And I just want to encourage you the course may not have been perfect. It may not have been easy. And I know it's not easy now, but I'm just saying the privilege to live life and to live life with this sense of new identity and new destiny and of knowing who Jesus is, learning who he is, and him learning and shaping you. If you can do that just once in your life, it's the greatest blessing of all your life. So let me encourage you to seek this fellowship with Jesus, to just dwell with him, abide with him, and ask the presence of Jesus to sort of percolate through your system and transform you and reshape you. And when the times are hard, just ask God's help with every word 
Ask for God's strength and His joy for every deed. And know when you love sacrificially in the name of Jesus, you are now sharing in the greatest tune and the greatest song the world has ever known. And you're singing your own verse and your own contribution to it. And we should not be overcome that we have fallen along the way. We should be overcome that grace has ever, ever worked on us at all. So let's abide. Let's soak Jesus up and let him into who we are. And let's speak differently and work differently. And for all of you who witness the goodness of God, especially moms, we think of you this day. I want to say, it's the greatest thing you've ever done in all your life to join the chorus and the music of the sweet gospel of Jesus Christ. I commend you. I celebrate you. I ask you to count and honor the blessing it is to know the Lord Jesus and to see his word in your words, to see his work in your work. There is a place of quiet rest sin cannot molest near to the heart of God oh, Jesus blessed Redeemer sent from the heart of God hold us who wait before thee near to the of comfort sweet near to the heart of God a place where we our Savior meet near to the heart of God oh Jesus blessed Redeemer sent from the extend to you this blessing on Mother's Day. I want to bless my wife. Thank you, Debbie, for your profound and wonderful and rich uh, motherhood. I, I celebrate your mom, Debbie. I, um, I just remember being impressed by how she could work and work and seem to never grow tired when it was doing something for us. And with my uh, siblings and my grandkids, I remember my mom intuitively just somehow knowing what to say and how to speak it and so on. I know you have your own memory, and I would just ask you to bless that memory this day and encourage those you can speak to. The goodness of God is shown to us so often in the wonderful word and the kind deed of a mother. So let me send you out from this word, this place, with this word before you. Let me challenge you that you have a new destiny identity with God. And let me challenge you to live in the richness of the dwelling presence of the Spirit. And your indwelling in the power of Jesus Christ. And let me ask you to go forward and speak in his name. Word and work in his name. Deeds and works that will give Christ glory. It's his name, Lord. We celebrate, bless them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.